Uh, here you have Nef Queen Amos Nefertari. This is her son in front of her and their, their ancestors. So they're sitting in front of an altar. And this is not her husband, this is her son. So her son actually is uh, depicted with his mother and not the father. This is one of the things that's interesting about the tradition is that they follow the matrilineal line. It was a matriarchal culture, even though it doesn't seem that way. People say, wait a minute, the kings were usually the men. Yeah, but he might have been a symbol of authority, but the source of that authority was Here is Hesse Reyes, the first known dentist in the history of humanity. Uh, I was saying just a minute ago that he just came from the barber. This is a fresh cut. And I think we have to agree that Hesse Ray, uh, the great dentist, and not only is he a dentist, but he was a chief dentist. He was head of all of the dentists. And Hesse Ray is somebody that is um, generally overlooked. There are six different panels of Hesse Ray that comes from a tomb right near the Great Pyramids. And these are in the Cairo Museum. And you'll be be uh, sad to know that 95% of the people walk right past Hesse Ray and never noticed him. They never noticed him. He's off to the side, but yet he's one of the most important men and dentists in the history of humanity. He's the first known. And obviously, if he's a chief of dentists, then he comes from a, a tradition of dentistry. So it's important to know that. In Kemet, they didn't just look at a medical interpretation of illness, but it was also a sociological interpretation as well. You know, people say, hey, you know, so-and-so makes me sick. And they literally say that. I never make that kind of statement because no one can make me sick. It's, it's on me. But for them, uh, it's a sociological interpretation of illness as well as a medical one, meaning that relationships matter. And you don't heal the individual, you, you heal the family. So there were letters to the ancestors as well. And so they communicate with those on the other side. And I, you know, I meant to say I want to dedicate this to Brother Henry Hightower, Brother Henry, has always been one of those long-term supporters that actually go back to the 20th century. When I moved back to the Bay Area in the 90s, Henry was always there. He was one of the great supporters. But this is how, nevertheless, medicine was looked at in Kemet. It was, a, you know, it was a comprehensive interpretation, and about 10 medical documents actually survived that we can actually read and examine. Many of you know the first known doctor in the history of humanity is Imhotep. The Greeks called him Aesculapius. And so, um, you know, then the name uh, Hippocrates comes around. People talk about uh, uh, Hippocrates is the father of medicine. Well, the father of European medicine, if you want to say that. So people take the Hippocratic Oath. But when I went to Kemet with one of the uh, sisters, she said, we didn't take no Hippocratic Oath. Oath. I'm a medical doctor. We took the Imhotepian Oath. And that's what they took. They took the Imhotepian Oath, oath and they rewrote it to make it close to the original one. And so, uh, but most of the framework for the, the oath that doctors have to take today, it goes back to what comes out of Kemet. So Imhotep is the first known doctor in the history of humanity. It's about 2800 or so BCE or 4,800 years ago. But it's, that's the, on the male side. And you know, and, and, and he was also a great architect as well. Uh, and somewhat of high stature in the country. But it's not only uh, Imhotep and his contributions, but it's Pesha Shet. Pesha Shet is the first known female doctor in the history of humanity. There's no evidence of any female pos uh, physician on record that we know by name other than Pesha Shet. And you see her here on the left. And so it's important to know that for Africans, you could not have a, a high position unless you were a, in the government, unless you were a first a spiritual practitioner. You had to be a priest or a priestess as a prerequisite to hold high office. So not only was she a, uh, a director of female doctors, but she also was, uh, was uh, a high priestess as well. And this clearly indicates, I remember uh, many years ago, and it was in the early 2000s, Dr. Obinga and I would go to the library every single day on a Sunday. We would go from, from two p.m. to 1 a.m., uh, literally. I'm sorry, excuse me, the other way around. From 1 p.m. on a Sunday to 2 a.m., 13 consecutive hours. I remember when we uh, we actually saw this image of Pesha Shet uh, quite some time ago, but she's the first known female doctor in the history of humanity. So it's a male and female. Also, in terms of the evidence from Kemet, if you want to talk about medicine, then we have to look at surgical documents. 
it is not unusual for people in the Journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA, to refer to this document here. It's, this is the oldest surgical document, uh, known document in the world. And it comes from a much older document. It was rewritten. So right around this time period, you know, 1600 or 1500 or so BCE, before the Common Era, the people in Kemet were rewriting documents because they didn't have scanners, fax machines, they didn't have copiers, so the scribes would copy documents by hand. And so a lot of documents, you know, they decay over time, just like regular paper does. And here, this document is written from a much older surgical document. It was purchased by Edwin Smith. And so people mis they misnamed this as the Edwin Smith Surgical Papyrus, which is preposterous. How could it be named after the man that bought the document more than 3,400 years later? This is a document with 48 cases dealing with neurosurgery. In other words, there were cases from the top of the head to the base of the spine, a clinical assessment of broken bones, injuries, and you name it, it had to do with, with the lacerations. So this is a clinical assessment of injuries. The problem with the name, of course, is named after the man that bought it. It has nothing to do with Africa. And I have here, uh, while I went to a museum exhibit, the Metropolitan Museum, they claim that this was named after the original owner. How can it be, how can it be the original owner? What kind of nonsense is that? But this is the public propaganda that's presented when, uh, when we're not careful. So what should we do with this name? Well, it's quite obvious. Let's get rid of it. Let's get rid of the name because it has nothing to do with Edwin Smith. It has nothing to do with Edwin Smith. So what do we call it? Well, we can call it the you know, ancient Comitian or ancient African ancient, but it has nothing to do with Edwin Smith. And you notice that there are two colors. And the red color means that it's a diff it's a new case. It's a new medical, uh, sorry, a new, a new medical case with the document. And they were very clear about the functions of the brain, the central nervous system, you name it. It's a clinical assessment. So they actually examined uh, details. So this document, for example, it was broken down in this way. So in the 48 cases, they would have like instructions for uh, constructions concerning a wound to the eyebrow. And then they would make an examination and then a diagnosis. And the diagnosis always had three possibilities that either they'll treat the injury or they'll contend with the injury, or there's nothing they can do to treat it. And you see a lot of different things, but they use bandages, splints. Um, uh, they stitched up a lot of people, and the most important sub uh, substance that was used was always honey. Honey. Honey was the most important substance used on every injury. They use honey, and that's the one food that does not decay. And it's interesting how they had a very clear understanding that if somebody has an injury to the right side of their brain, look for, or right side of the head, look for some problems on the other side. And they knew that. Here, what you're looking at is a skull that has to do with evidence of trepanation, the first known trepanation in the history of humanity comes out of this whole Nile Valley complex. What is trepanation? It's when the physicians drill a hole in the skull to relieve pressure on the brain. And so that's something that continues to go on now, but it has its origins in classical Africa, and the evidence is clear from the physical remains, from the actual skeletal evidence itself. And as people still practice this in the area, I've seen someone, uh, I saw trepanation being practiced in Kenya, for example. We take a look at this. These are the telltale signs of trepanation. It's very sensitive to drill a hole in the in the skull. And so, what are, what are we pointing out here? Notice that there's an indentation. Now, if there's a hole that was drilled in the skull to relieve pressure on the brain. The question is, where's the hole? That's a logical question. What happened to the hole? Well, the reason why we don't see a hole with this skull. And this would have been the hole right here. You see this indentation? The reason why there's no, there's no uh, hole is because the patient survived. If the patient didn't survive, then you would still see a hole. And you don't see that now. So this is evidence of, of uh, an ancient African 
uh, deep knowledge of the body and the skull, which is very sensitive. This is light years ahead of the Greeks, for example. They thought it was evil to cut on the human body. But this is telltale signs here of trepanation. It's uh, an important medical advancement here, but Africans don't get credit because you have silly uh, games like this. Ha, 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 he, he, he. They're having fun. Let's drill a hole in the skull, everybody. And they present this, but it has no connection to Africa whatsoever. And so uh, this is nothing, there's no way that Europe could have come up with this kind of understanding because the Greeks, who were leaders among them, were quite ignorant of uh, medical practices. They were very, very ignorant, to say the least. But trepanation is very important. It's used today, but it's just that Africans don't get credit. That is over 200 literally over 200 medical terms for the body. The, the physicians in Kemet, they name everything. They name all of the different parts because they were experienced and accomplished physicians. So over 200 medical terms. And not only the exterior, uh, exterior uh, of our body, nose, nose, lips, ears, more than that, on the inside, the brain, the central nervous system, the spinal cord, everything was named in great detail because these were experienced clinicians and surgeons. And uh, here, all the bones in the body named. And so uh, all of the internal organs, particularly the ones that they took out during embalming, it's uh, all there. And um, now another important document, other than the surgical document, is the so-called, I got it in quotation, Evers Internal Medical Papyrus. This is the oldest internal medicine document in the history of the world, dealing with diseases, diagnosis, and treatments for all kinds of different illnesses. Can you imagine that? No matter where you are this morning, just think about how long 66 feet is. You can unroll this scroll and it would not fit in probably any room that you're in unless you're outside. 66 feet, in other words, over 800 different internal medicine cases. And yet somebody would like us to think that they did not have a viable medical tradition. Oh, yes, they did. And these documents that survived clearly indicate a deep knowledge of medicine and health and healing. But of course, this is an African contribution to the world. So we're not going to allow anybody to give credit to the European who bought this in the 1860s. Again, thousands of years after the document was, uh, was rewritten. So we got to give credit where credit is due. This is the oldest internal medicine document in, in the history of humanity. And it's a lot of insight. They use many different things in nature for healing. Here's one I want to share with you. This one is not as well known, the Hearst Medical Papyrus. This one is at the UC Berkeley collection right here in Berkeley. And, um, and this one has over 200 different cases. Now, anytime you see red, folks, it means that it means it's a new medical case. If it was a mathematical document, it would be a new problem. But in this case, it's uh, over 200 different cases. And they, the medical, the Hearst Medical Papyrus, they indicated with great detail knowledge of the circulation of blood in the body. They had remedies for treatments of the lung. Uh, uh, anybody that, that was uh, bitten by a hippo or if a tooth fell out or if they were, were a purging uh, helping someone to purge, pain, digestion, urinary issues, a whole list, uh, constipation, you name it, and also un uh, unidentified diseases that they say came from, from foreigners. There's a couple of cases where they talk about foreigners bringing in problems. They have healing, uh, you name it, even um, diseases dealing with, uh, with the blood. So a lot of different details. One that I found very interesting is that for stomach pains, you know, for stomach pains, they use wormwood leaves. And some of you may know that wormwood is very powerful. So when I travel, I keep wormwood, I keep black walnut, and I keep a lot of other powerful things. And I only not only keep it when I travel, but when I'm traveling locally as well, long before this um, social lockdown, so that I can stay fit and healthy. But we see this knowledge coming from Kemet. So the Hearst, Hearst Medical Papyrus, named after Phoebe Hearst, who funded this in the early uh, 20th century, this uh, document, this document uh, documents the fact that they had tremendous knowledge about the blood vessels and, and how blood works in the body. And so, uh, 
and you have other evidence of a of a long-standing tradition of medical insight. This is on a, to, a temple wall, and these are actually surgical tools. There's over three dozen surgical tools. Take a look at this one. You can see that this is a this is a knife used in surgery. You have forceps here. You have different spoons and hooks. All of these were used in surgery. So it's not theory. It's 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 the reality. And you have uh, here's a scale to measure things. And this is um, clearly documented thousands. Of years. You have a drill here. You see the drill. But this is on the uh, temple wall. We actually go to take people to see this so they can actually see it in person. Now, you know, in the old days, used to be, you know, doctors would make a house call. But guess what this physician is doing on the left? He's not making a house call. He's making what? A job call. He's actually going to the job to do eye repair. And this man's a carpenter on the right. Notice, notice that this is part of a building here. And the physician is seeing him at his job to uh, help with a little eye issue there. And um, so it was medical practices everywhere. This is why they, they felt that the ideal age for someone to live was 110 years old. So despite what you might read or what, what we may read about them not living a long life, that's nonsense. Uh, that has nothing to do with the, the facts of not only the written record, but also when you examine the actual mummies as well. Take a look at this. This is one of the most important uh, pieces of evidence that there is about a high level medical tradition in Kemet. Take a look at this. This is the world's oldest prosthetic toe, the oldest in the history of humanity, 3,000 years old. This is a lady, this is a sister who was in Kemet about 3,000 years ago. Take a very close look at this. What do you notice? You should notice probably a couple things here. You should probably notice a couple, a couple things. One, uh, let me help you out. I know you're on mute. Uh, away from the toe for a second. Take a look at this. This is strands of braided hair. This is this is an African. There's no question whatsoever. That's number one. What else do you notice? So which one is the uh, artificial toe? Which one of these? It's the big toe. And the question is, what foot is this? Is it a left foot or is it a right foot? This is clearly a what? Right foot. Left foot. Uh oh, no, no, it's a right foot. So, so oh, look, look, look. yeah, look at your foot. So it's a right foot. And, um, and look, so this is actually from her mummy, literally. But what's significant about this is not only is the first, world's first prosthetic toe before others had any knowledge of this, but guess what? Guess what color the physicians chose? They chose a rich, beautiful, chocolate brown color for the toe, well, why did they do that? Well, it's quite obvious they did it to match what? The skin tone. They wouldn't have given the, the <laughs> a beautiful, rich, brown, <laughs> big toe to match anything other than the person's skin tone. So not only is this an important medical uh, piece of evidence, but also in terms of the identity of the people, unmistakable. There's no question, there's no argument, there's no debate. It's very clear, this is the first and the oldest known artificial toe in the history of humanity. I'm showing you first, and this is another first. And here's another angle of that. These are the actual toes of the ancestor 3,000 years ago. And, uh, and, and you know what, it also looks as this, it also looks as though they fitted this maybe a couple of times to make sure that it was a, a nice comfortable fit. So uh, they, they did, and it looks, look, you, you think this is modern? No, 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 it's not modern. It's, it's, uh, it's classical Africa at its best. That's why we look at, that's why we say classical African civilization. Sure, we can call it ancient, but it's not just about being ancient, it's about being classical. Classical means what? Highest rank, the highest value, the highest class, anything that has permanent and lasting value. That's why we call these uh, classical African contributions to humanity. And you all, everybody would have to agree, this looks like it's quote unquote modern. But be careful about the term modern because people normally think it means better or some higher level. It does not. You know, a lot of times the older or the original is the best. Now, uh, moving on, take a look at this. This is the Temple of Dendera. We go here on a special day uh, during our educational tour to Kemet to show you the size of this massive temple. Here's a person on the roof. And you'll be very surprised. We don't have time to show it today. 
but you'll be very, very surprised that, do you know, there's actually a temple beneath this temple. So the ground that people are walking on, there's actually a temple beneath that. And they always talk about an earlier temple dedicated to Het Heru. And uh, it's not myth, legend, and fable. The actual remains of that temple, you can see it because a block has been taken out inside of the temple, you can see the top of the earlier temple. Anyway, so um, this temple, among many others, they not only had the sacred lake, so there's no such thing as sprinkling somebody with water. No, a person had to immerse themselves in the water to be clean, spiritually and physically clean, but also there's the birth house associated with this and many other temples. But it's not just the birth house. That's a misunderstanding. It's also the Paran, or the house of life. So in the Paran, or the so-called birth house, that's where the that's where the priests and the physicians they did their work. And there's no real difference between the physicians and priests. A person first had to be a priest before he or she can be a high-level physician. So they would uh, they would not only uh, have give birth in the birth house here, but also the priests would induce healing dreams. Very important to induce healing dreams so that to take one into the spirit realm and to, uh, and to ascertain what is the source and the cure to the problem. And to go to these kind of places and to have the, the most important priest, the sesh per unk. Sesh per unk means scribe of the house of life. These men, and they were largely brothers who were the sesh per unk, they were so powerful that when the foreigners came, they called them magicians because they can manipulate energy. And their ability to heal is outlined in a lot of different uh, texts and documents. So people, obviously, tourists walk by this area and they go right to the main temple, but they, they miss one of the most important areas where the priest did their best work to heal. It was a healing center, um, the, 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 the Perak, or the house of life, and you see the symbols here. And Dendera is one of many temples. And uh, of course, giving birth, it's all about gravity. And you, you know, obviously sisters on the call, you know better than I do, but it makes sense. It makes perfect sense to give birth in this manner. And you know, the Western ways, they want to have somebody lay down, but gravity uh, takes over. So this is actually a uh, birthing stool. This is actually a birthing stool. So the midwives, they would actually grab the baby through this opening right here. And these, and these, and these are actually bricks. So there's bricks, and the bricks, like in one of the art, uh, archaeological sites, the, the birthing bricks have been found, and the name on there is the, is the per unk. So this is how they, the posture in which they gave birth. They also had pregnancy tests. They had uh, contraception, you name it. So one of the pregnancy tests was to examine the blood vessels near the breast area to determine if a, if a lady was pregnant or not. Another test to do to determine gender would be for several days, the, the, the woman who may, that they're trying to see if she's pregnant or not, she would urine on uh, grains of wheat and grains of barley. And so if the, if, the, if the barley sprouted, then she would have a boy. If the wheat sprouted, then she would have a girl. If neither one sprouted, not pregnant. And so people try to replicate and duplicate to see whether or not the wheat and barley test was accurate. The problem is this: in Kemet, they don't give any details. They don't give any details. They don't give any details about anything. They don't give details about about how much of any ingredient to use or anything like that. They don't give any details about about uh, about medicine. They don't give any details about marriage. All you know is some a couple's married because they're seated together. Or the text just says that they founded a house together. No such thing as a marriage ceremony that's outlined. You don't see any details. You don't even see the details on how they did mathematical problems. All you have is a problem and the solution. And you know that they knew what they're doing because there's no errors on any of the problems. So when people try to replicate and duplicate to see if uh, the barley and wheat process would work. They don't understand that there are details. There's also rituals and ceremonies involved. There's words of power that are involved with every healing, every healing. So that, that's left out when people try to, re, uh, they try to recreate 
the uh, the process. Oh, and one thing that I, uh, I think it might be interesting is that they actually use peppermint to speed up labor. They would rub peppermint on the posterior, <laughs> and uh, they rub peppermint on the on the lady's posterior to speed up the labor. Um, anyway, in terms of deities that govern a lot of this, here's one: Tauret. She's the hippopotamus here, who uh, is in who's in charge. So who's in charge of childbirth? There's a team of physicians here, or uh, deities. Uh, Tauret is one. You see a statue here and a relief on the left. That's one image. It's the uh, it's the crocodile. As you, uh, sorry, it's the hippo. The hippo in, partly in charge for uh, the medical tradition. But not only the hippo, not only uh, hippo being charged with medical, but mainly childbirth. But there's also Bess. He is he is the protector of children, and he comes from the the south, from the small stature people. It is Bess. He's the one that is uh, has a, a long-standing central role in the the whole medical field. He was a a, a great um, person with the music as a musician, but also as protector of children. A lot of times you see him with a knife in hand to make sure children are safe. But the most important deity in the entire medical profession is Sekhmet. There's no deity more important than Sekhmet. As a matter of fact, the most common statue that you find in any temple anywhere is Sekhmet, the lioness. She's the powerful lioness. Sekhmet is intricately involved with the uh, medical arts. And you see her everywhere you see an image in a temple, you see Sekhmet, the lioness. And her name means what? The powerful one, the lioness. She's the most important of all of the deities. They all have a role, but there's nobody more central than uh, Sekhmet. We know also just a couple more things I want to share with you. We know about the, the wajet eye or the sound eye. Here is from the what? Where does this come from? This comes from the artifacts from the tomb of King Tut An Amen. Not Tut. That's somebody else's short name, but Tut An Amen, the living image of the god Amen. And this is a uh, part of the tremendous jewelry that comes from his tomb. And so uh, the Wajet eye, the sound eye, we're told in the story that Haru, he loses his eye in a battle and then when his eye is restored by Juhuti, this becomes known as the sound eye. The eye is a symbol for what? For, for sound health. This is the fundamental symbol for health is when you see the Wajet eye. It's a medical symbol. Sometimes you might see it as a mathematical symbol as well, but it has to do fundamentally with health. And people debate this, of whether or not the Wajet eye associated with Haru is the origin of the RX symbol, having to do with uh, the pharmacy and medicine. Some people say, ah, oh, you know, the RX has to do with, uh, to, it means to, to, uh, to, take, uh, to take some kind of remedy or something like that, and it comes from a Latin term. Others say, nope, uh, that's superficial, it goes back before that. I think it's a strong case that the YZI is the origin of this RX symbol that we see in pharmacy and medicine but this is one of the most important medical symbols that you see. And of course, they were the masters of mummification. I don't show mummies because I don't disrespect the ancestors. I never will, but I will show you an x-ray. That your mummies look like they're simply resting peacefully, literally, thousands of years old. And what kind of knowledge does someone have to have to mummify a human body? Well, there's a number of different fields. A person, uh, a group must, they must master what? Anatomy. And what else? And botany. And what else? Chemistry. And what else? Pharmacology. These were masters of it. And they would be able to preserve the vital organs. There's four vital organs that were preserved in mummification. Does anybody know what those are? It's not the heart. Not the heart. The heart is on the scale being judged against the feather of my eye. It's the liver, the lungs the stomach, and the intestines. Those are the four critical organs, the liver, the lungs, the stomach, and intestines. But what did they do with the brain? I'm glad you asked. They saw the brain is just waste matter. They would take it out through the nose, throw it away. For them, the center of intelligence was the heart. 
you perceive with your heart. Uh, so the brain did not have the same value as the heart. You can tell when someone's heart is not in it. You can always tell that, but for them, the heart is crucial and it is, um, it's the center of intelligence and that's how they looked at everything. Just one last thing I wanna share with you is letters to the ancestors. Most of these letters are written on bowls, as you can see, bowls. So this is the bottom side of different bowls here. And these are letters written to the ancestors. Why would they write letters to the ancestors? Because they're writing to help them in the physical world, to help them to make sure that the crops have enough water so that the Nile River overflows. They ask them for help in disputes. They ask for the health of, uh, of, of, of the new babies that would be born. And you see a lot of the requests of the ancestors to help to make sure that they can have healthy relations. And so letters to the ancestors, one of the most critical and important categories of communication. And most are on bowls, but you do see some on papyrus as well, but mainly uh, bowls. And um, so finally, if you wanted to look at some of the substances that they use, this is a pretty good uh, book. It doesn't have all the details that I shared, but if you look at ancient Egyptian herbal, you have uh, you have the, the, the image, I'm sorry, the name in Madden Nature, named it, Jordan. and also modern as well. So anyway, that's one source that you can look at if you wanted to see some of the, the items and substances that they used in the old days. So a lot of this comes from the time, the 18th dynasty, I already mentioned, uh, Amos Nefertari and Amos, but it's also the same time period as the famous ruler Tut Ankh Amun. He's as Afrikoid as they come, as is the evidence that I share with you. None of this has anything to do with anybody other than us. This is for us and by us. So it, it, it makes no sense to use anybody else's uh, tradition to, to figure out how to heal. And healing is about balance, and it's always that way. So that's what I wanted to share with you all this morning, folks, a little bit about the medical tradition and the great African healers that, that we call to help us to move forward. So, uh, Ashe.